Welcome to the Zapruder Film Symposium is seen believing in the death of JFK. First of all, I want to say that I'm pleased to be here today. And um, as we're driving up here, and I haven't been in this part of the country in maybe a couple of decades, I was here a number of times for my book tour. Um, I was thinking about the fact that um, we have maybe 30 people in the room or something, and we have a nation of something around the order of 300 million people. So there are 30, 30 people who believe that uh, that's one in 10 million that the Zabruder film was altered. And even if you double or triple or tenfold it, there's no question about it that we're in the minority. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that I think we're right. And I know I am positive this film was altered, and that's what made me decide to come here today to speak. Now, just to fill in some time in my own life, I just want to say that since my book was published in 81, I was going to do a sequel to Best Evidence, which is still half written. But some other events intervened, and I've gotten very much involved in Oswald. And I've been working on Oswald full time for 10 years. So I know now and as much about Oswald's life as I knew when I published Best Evidence about the president's body. And I really have a tremendous overview of this case, so I can bring some of those insights to bear peripherally. And I think I know exactly what happened in Dealey Plaza in terms of the general uh, plan for this assassination and how it was carried out and the role that films played. So even though I was told by a number of people not to come here, including certain researchers and one important TV producer who talked about credibility and the notion that this is a crackpot idea, uh, I've decided that since I'm now 63 years old, I have the, uh, what I call the luxury of what I call the deathbed test. If someday I'm in an old age home and I'm looking back, do I want to say that I didn't come here and voice my views on what this situation is? Things I firmly believe in, even though they're not things I'm about to publish on, because I'm not. But I played a very important role, as you'll see, or a significant role in the Zabruder film business. A very important behind the scenes role with Zabruder, with the family, with Robert Groden, um, with the ARRB, with Doug Horn, who's a very good friend of mine. And I've decided, since I'm playing cleanup here, and you all know what the film looks like, and since, unfortunately, I have a flight that leaves at 2.30 and have to leave here at 10.30, I'm going to try to stick to verbal stuff, although I have some overheads. But everybody knows what the film looks like, and I want to talk about the story of the path that I followed and the conclusions I've reached. And I was thinking that maybe the simplest way to begin is with my overview of the assassination, because the films play a part in it, uh, and a very significant part. But they're not the only thing. And um, can I just have the blackboard for a minute? And I'll just, just draw a diagram, simple stuff, simple kindergarten Dealey Plaza. Because, and I want to also say that I accept the fact, and have for years, that people disagree on all kinds of things in this case. So I don't expect that what I say is going to necessarily be agreed with just because I said it or anything of the sort. And, um, but from what I know about Oswald, and from what I know about the medical evidence, here is the way the plan worked to kill the President of the United States. And none of this is going to be hugely new. But they've got Lee Harvey Oswald who, and I'll, I'll be writing about this much more, is a fake Marxist. And when I say a fake Marxist, I mean he's a fake Marxist. He's not a little bit of a communist. He's not 20% of a communist. He's a fake Marxist, just as much as an undercover drug agent is not really a drug dealer. He's a fake drug dealer. Anyway, they've got this guy in the building. And you'll read about how they did that in my book. And, they and, they and the whole scenario is they're going to plan to kill the bring the president into Dealey Plaza, which is site-selected, OK, for certain reasons. And they're going to kill him in Dealey Plaza. Now they have a plan to make it look like this fake Marxist did the shooting. And how are they going to do that? They're going to bring the body to a place, which is H, hospital. And at the hospital, they're going to get the bullets out that they fired into the president and make it look like the fake Marxist $12 rifle did this shooting. Now, the reason I say he's a fake Marxist and he's not a 5% or a 10% or a 15% real communist is that this gun is a prop gun just as much as Oswald is a fake Marxist. And in my book, I'll get into the question of whether it was fired or not and all the rest of it and how they, how, why it has, looks so real and how the bullets get planted. But they go to the hospital and at the hospital is a plan to alter the president's body and make it look like the fake Marxist did the shooting. So in a sense, 
this is a doctor's plot. And this being a doctor's plot raises certain legal problems for anybody writing about it, including myself and my publisher. Now, they were not able to alter the body at Parkland Hospital. The body escaped from Parkland unaltered. It was seen at Parkland completely unaltered. And the reason that the doctors who were involved in this were not able to alter the body, and there's a lot of good guys at Parkland, but there are some bad eggs. The reason they were not able to go forward with the plan was that John Connolly got shot by accident. That is very important to understand. The Connolly shooting is an accident. The result is that the body had to be brought to Air Force One, brought back to Washington, and then unfolds the story of best evidence and the question of when did they get to the body, what did they do to the body, and all the rest of it. But that body, that body at Dealey Plaza was shot once through the neck, which everybody saw, and it was shot um, uh, once in the head, once or twice, probably, I think probably twice. There's a, probably a right front shot because of the grassy knoll evidence, and there's wonderful evidence for a left front shot also. But that's not the way it looks by the time it gets to Parkland, uh, excuse me, Bethesda Naval Hospital. At Bethesda Naval Hospital, it looks like it's shot twice from behind. And the two wounds that are on the body and seen in Dallas have been altered. The throat wound has become a mess. And this is covered all completely in chapter 11 of my book, the throat wound, the head, they've had surgery and they've enlarged the hole and all the rest of it. I'm bringing this stuff up only because I want to pre present it as a backdrop to what happened with the films. Because you have to understand that the center of the universe of the evidence, the sun in that solar system, is the body, not the films. And the films are really critical, but they're not the film. And I say that because in a forensic legal investigation, when a murder is committed at someone's Christmas party, they don't say, they don't say get us the 8 millimeter film. No, they say, get us the autopsy. What does the autopsy say? That's what the detectives want. That's what the district attorney wants. And in this case, that's what the attorney general wants. What's the autopsy on my brother's body say? That's the legal evidence of how the story of the shooting unfolded. Now, the films can present a real problem here if you've altered the body. Because the films can provide a photographic record in Dealey Plaza of what the body looked like. And if your whole plan is to alter the body, well, by God, you better pay attention to what's going on with the films or you can have serious problems, as turned out to be the case in Dealey Plaza in this assassination. And as I discovered, and I'm now, I'm now going to go through that story. Now, I know just now that what I've said, that the president was shot only from the front, you guys are not going to all agree with that. But I'm saying to you is the back of the body in this case is a blackboard on which a false history of this case is written. You can punch a hole in the back of the shoulder, put a bullet on a stretcher, you can punch a hole in the back of the head, which is seen, of course, at Parkland, excuse me, at Bethesda Naval Hospital, is reported. It's really not a hole. It's on the photographs. It's actually a hole, but not on the x-rays. It's a little notch or whatever. Excuse me, the, the, when the doctors testified. But I don't want to get into those issues. That's a side issue. I'm doing it only for one reason. I want to present context for what happened with the motion picture films in this case and how I encountered it in the course of my work with the body. Because in 1966, in the fall of 66, when I discovered the evidence the body was altered, this is brand new. What am I going to do with this? Where does it go? Um, well, what I did, of course, I had this peculiar mentor in my life who really taught me a lot about how the evidence and the law works. This is Liebler on the commission. And um, I brought my discoveries to him. It's all recounted in Best Evidence. And he said, well, why don't you attend my class as the devil's advocate, um, which I did every week, two times a week. And you have 16 students around a conference table, and they all believe the Warren Report. And I'm the sole dissenter, right? And Liebler and I have an agreement. I'm not going to talk about the fact that the body's altered because he's trying to get Chief Justice Warren to do something about it. He's written his memorandum. So it was a very exciting time in my life that all this was going down. And then during that period, where I had discovered surgery and wound alteration, Liebler sends to Life magazine and says, I'm a professor. I'm holding a class. You have these slides, because these issues that you all know about so well have come out. Let's can you get us the slides at the Beverly Hills Office of Time Life? Well, the slides are shipped out to California. Now, I had already known from frame 323 of the Zapruder film, published in Life magazine, and it seemed odd to me that the back of the president's head was all black. The back of the head was all black where the Dallas doctors reported a wound. And my first reaction was, why is that? What's go you know, how can that be? And I, you know, I thought, well, maybe the Life magazine editors, for reasons of taste, you know, painted it over before they went to the press. They didn't want a gory picture. I, I wondered about innocent explanations like that. 
So I knew that when Lieber wrote these slides sent to the Beverly Hills Office of Time Life, I would be able to get an up close and personal look at the actual four by fives. Well, in come these slides, and it's black out on the four by fives. So, so we go up one step in the story. I said, well, you know, maybe somebody altered the four by fives for you know C. D. Jackson, the editors of Life, to keep things under control. They don't want a messy picture being created for the record, and all that kind of you know, high conjecturing. Well, um, so I'm puzzled by this, and it remained a puzzle, and I want to tell you what happened with that puzzle in a bit. Meanwhile, as you all know, I was working at Ramparts Magazine for a, the summer of 66, and had this idea of getting a famous physicist to attest to the fact that the backward motion of the president's head was totally inconsistent with the notion of a shot from um, the rear. And having been a graduate of physics at Cornell, and you know, you're brought up in this physics ethos that this is it, this is the law, there's no room for argument about this kind of thing. I, I was personally kind of almost intellectually insulted when I was shown the backward head snap that, well, come on, what's going on here with the Warren Report? That's how I got involved in it, as I described in Best Evidence. So I, as recounted yesterday, I went in and had this appointment with Dr. Richard Feynman, a friend of mine in graduate school, was a friend, uh, was, a, was taking classes at Caltech and knew him. So we went in there together and we had this wonderful afternoon with him. And he takes out his little ruler. I told her I wanted to make a statement about this. And he takes out his little ruler and measures and finds, lo and behold, that there's a small forward motion between 312 and 313. Well, that was just amazing to me. I didn't know about it. I felt ashamed that I didn't know about it. I hadn't checked my evidence properly. I felt unprepared. And I wrote about some of this in my book. And what did it mean? And what it meant to me was that I had to come up with an explanation for how, if the president's body is moving backward, it moved forward for one frame. And I wrote a memo about this, and I think you'll find Paul Hoke published it, a note about the Zebruder film, and I had theorization, theorizing about, you know, if you have a high enough forward angle shot, the head could rotate. I, I'm saying these things quickly because I subsequently rejected all this stuff, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Meanwhile, that little forward motion, you understand, is not visible to the naked eye in motion. It's only 1 18th of a frame. So when, when it was brought to my attention that Dan Rather, on November 25th, I'm told, according to the AWRB work, not the 23rd as I used to believe, but anyway, that should be settled one way or the other. But Dan Rather, on the 25th of November, made a broadcast and said the head moves violently forward. He's talking about a macroscopic thing that he can see, that anyone can see, violently forward. Well, the head does not move violently forward in the Zabruder film, as you know. It moves violently backwards. And we're not talking about the kind of subtlety that Richard Feynman discovered in my presence, or that you know, other people will confirm the little motion from 312 to 313. So um, that's where matters stood. And now I have to jump forward a little bit. More and more, as I attended Liebler's class, and this went on for about a year, I realized that the Zapruder film was the biggest, held the biggest potential challenge to my view that the body had been altered because the Zapruder film showed the back of the head blacked out, or it showed no, let's put it this way, it showed no wound there. And so the question became, why was this? Was there no wound there? Were all the Dallas doctors wrong? Which is the better evidence? The Dallas doctors who saw the, the body right away of the film? Well, most laymen would say it would be the film. If you have a picture taken in Dealey Plaza and it shows there's no wound there, then all the doctors must be wrong. And that's the story you'll hear, and I've heard from Vincent Bugliosi or Tink Thompson or whoever, not Tink Thompson, I'll take that back, Vincent Bugliosi and other people who will argue against the existence of the Dallas observations by citing the Zabruder film. So I knew very early on that this was really important. So what are we going to do about this? How are you going to get hold of this film? Because now I have another... I'm going to up your, your audio. Am I all right with this? Okay. The question became... Am I right? Okay. What are we going to do about this... Um, this film. I now have seen the slides. We know on the page it's blacked out. I've seen the slides. It's blacked out on the back of the head on the slides. Now the question became, what, how did this happen? What about the film itself? I mean, I never, I don't know anything about optical work on films in 1966, 7, 8, and 9. What's going, what about this film? So I had to come up with a way of dealing with this because I'm researching this thing. I'm writing this book, which eventually became Best Evidence and is published 10 years later. And I'm up against this real problem. I don't want to go publish these medical, this medical hypothesis, and what am I going to do? And then out's going to come life you know, critics or researchers or whoever, and, and there's no internet. Then they say, look, you're all wrong. All the Dallas doctors are wrong. So I had to get a way to look at this film. I want to see, is it really on the film? Because I was really still thinking maybe on the film itself, the actual film that went through, you're going to see what the Dallas doctors saw. Why shouldn't you? They saw the body four minutes later. 
Well, enter another person at this point, Haskell Wexler. And Haskell Wexler is a famous cinematographer, some of you may know from the 60s. He's Jane Fonda's cinematographer, and he had a company called Dove Films. So I knew somebody that knew Haskell, and he performed the introductions. And I, by that time, was really into the whole business of covert operations, and you have to do what Alan Dulles does, you know, to get your thing done. You have to go indirectly and dream up these little deceptions. So I said, okay, I asked Haskell if I can use his letterhead and write a letter to Life magazine that we want to buy the film for a million dollars. So this letter goes out, which, was, which I played a big role in drafting. And it goes to New York City. It's a time life. And you know, it's over Haskell's signature. Well, Dick Pollard, the head of photography at Life, and I always will believe this, that it's not so much they wanted the money, but I think Dick Pollard had a girlfriend or something up there named Ann Drayton. And Drayton is the one that had helped Tank Thompson with his book and everything. I think you'll find her main name possibly mentioned. I hope I have the right name. But anyway, he says, okay, if everybody wants to go to California for a weekend, you know, we'll send the Zapruda film or this box of materials out to California. Because we told him that in order to appraise the film, I left this part out of the story, to appraise the film, um, we have to have this film looked at by our appraisers. Of course, my, the appraisers were David Lifton and <laughs> Fred Newcomb and a guy named Dennis Roy and a guy who's now passed away, Jack Clementi, who is an expert in optics from Lake China Naval, Naval Air Station in uh, China Lake in, in California. And Jack was a good friend of mine. So, we, um, so the film is sent out. A box of materials are sent out. And it was quite a stunning experience. And I must tell you that you folks here have the tremendous privilege of, you know, let's roll this film and listen on the internet, and I'll show you frame 323, and this is digitized. And none of that's there. I mean, none of that exists in 1960. Uh, Six, seven, eight, nine, seventy. There's no internet. There's none of this. And every time you want to get a color blow-up made, you better have 20 bucks to pay a color laboratory. I mean, it's very expensive and all that. Anyway, he sends out this box of materials, and we don't know what we're going to get, but I knew there's going to be a film in there. They told me that. Well, that's, they told Haskell that. So I rented a Ray Kordak microfilm reader, so I can pull the film that they're going to send. Not the original, but they, they said we're sending 16 and 35 millimeter prints. They're going to pull this film through the reader. Uh, frame by frame. I'm going to look at this thing and I want to get to the frame three. I want to see this whole sequence of the back of the head. So they send the film to the West Coast. You know, we trundle up our Record Act microfilm reader to the Beverly Hills office of Time Life. We set it up and, um, they, and right away, I mean, they show this stunning film which you all take for granted now. This film's qualities you've seen and everything. And then I pull, we start pulling this film, film through. Now, I did not share with other people in the room, except Jack, what my hypothesis was about wound alteration. We get to the wounds, and I'm stunned because everybody was saying at the moment, the wounds look painted on. It looked weird. Right away, you could see it. You have to be an expert to see that something's wrong with these wounds. People have written books and chapters about the blob and how it looks, and there's the back of the head blacked out on the film. And I say, what the hell is going on here? How did they manage to do that? Who is they? How did this work? So, um, <sighs> The questions I asked were, the film was altered, why, what was being hidden, and um, how could someone do that in 1963, and why not just destroy the film? So, there was an, I'm leaving out some parts of the story, what happened in the room that day, because there was actually a fist fight, which is a great part of the story, but we'll talk about it another time. But <laughs> one person in the room decided that he could see something on the film, and he wanted to make an immortal picture of it. So he, when, when Dan went to the bathroom or something, he takes out a 35 millimeter camera and starts photographing frames in a light box. And I'm saying, put the camera away, we get sued, you know, and all that. We get, there was one punch thrown, and then Ann steps back into the room, and suddenly it's like out of a Groucho Marx comedy, and we're going, oh, you know, everything's fine. Did you enjoy your potty break, you know? We get back to looking at this stuff. So this is what happened. So. When the, when the stuff went back in the box that day, we were all very depressed. And I know I was very upset about it because we're never going to see this stuff again. Life has it in a vault in New York. It's 1970. I mean, how are we ever going to see this stuff? This crazy story I made up got them to ship the stuff out to the West Coast. We pulled it. I now know that the film has these images on it. They look phony. I don't understand how it was done. And I immediately... Uh, started to educate myself, and I went to Melnitz Hall at UCLA, to the library there, and start reading up about optics. And very quickly, I learned about the whole field of optical printers. And this is 1970, and I learned about the printers and what's going on, and and how you do this if you want to do it. Um, and meanwhile, I'm thinking, well, is there some other way of something else you can grab onto that proves that something that this film was edited. And I don't, re don't remember the exact event that happened, but I, I think it was myself reading along. I came across the account of a witness who said the car stopped. So, of course, I know the car didn't stop. And I said to Pat Lambert, 
who was my closest friend at the time, and I said, we've got to scan the entire record for car stop witnesses. So we start scanning for car stop witnesses. And of course, within a few days, we have 15 or 20 car stop witnesses. And I say, son of a bitch, the car stopped, and they took out the stop. Who's they? How'd they do this? And I'm, you know, I know about optical printers now. And then there's a great quote, and I, I couldn't find it in time for this lecture, but you will find it in the Dallas Morning News or the Dallas Times Herald of 20, not remember 23rd or 4th, maybe the 25th, but it was one of those first two or three days. Sheriff Decker is being interviewed, and he says about the assassination, well, you know, this assassination took about 20 seconds. I mean, it's right there, right out of Decker's mouth. So he's giving us 20 seconds. All these people are saying the car stopped, and you start to get a sense of, boy, somebody did something with the film. And I realized fully, immediately, the importance of the car stop witness. In 1971, that's the Thanksgiving after that, the summer of discovery, I went to Dallas with a tape recorder. As a matter of fact, the same Sony TC-800 you see in the Nixon Watergate affair. And I visited with the Newmans, Franzen, and Mormon. And um, I interviewed them. And um, the, the Newmans were unabashed about it, that the car stopped right in front of them. And I, had, I got good supporting statement from Franzen and the Chisholms. And I can't by memory tell you exactly the exact quotes. But I've transferred this stuff to digital audio, and I believe it's part of this deed of gift I've created for the National Archives. But I believe the car stopped, and I believe these witnesses are telling the truth. Meanwhile, I'm learning all about optical printing, what it is, the whole field of special effects. And I'm also understanding logically that if the car stop is removed in the Zapruder film, it has to be removed in the Nix film. In other words, you can't go at this idea that you know one film is altered and just wave your hand at the rest. They, Either it's, it's double or nothing or triple or nothing, and you start to get into this, and it turns out to be quite a project. And then you're accused of saying, well, you're just making the conspiracy bigger to accommodate your hypothesis. Well, that's too bad. I'll never go down in the history books for any famous physical hypothesis, um, like famous physicists of centuries ago. But the David Lifton lemma, if you want to call it, assertion is that if you alter the Zebruder film, you must alter the next film. There's no way around it. This hard stop is either there in reality or it's not there. It happened or it didn't happen. And um, now, that's where we were for a few years. Then the CIA releases a batch of documents. And it's 1974 or 5. And Paul Hoke calls me up. And he has a document for oh, CIA 450, I believe the number is. And it shows all these. And you've all seen it with the tabulations and the frame numbers on the left and the different here's three shots, here's three, different, different three shot scenarios. And I was very excited in telling Paul, well, this is, the CIA had the film before life did. This was my first reaction. It turns out that it's not quite that way, but almost. And, um, and I really assumed, well, the CIA had the film. They must have done the special effects there. And this is before I really got into the special effects completely, the way I understand it today. And just like make a brief aside, no, the CIA does not do special effects work. They have great cameras. They analyze pictures from the sky. They can tell you how many trucks are going across the desert in Iraq and all that. But they don't have special effects guys at the CIA. If they need to have a film of uh, Sukarno having intercourse with some blonde woman, they'll sub it out to somebody in Hollywood. They don't have movie studios over in Langley. Um, they'd sub it out. But they do have the greatest stuff for analyzing, but not for synthesizing films. I mean, I'm sure that stuff subbed out. I, I made my own inquiries. And of course, once you get into special effects, by the way, I got into this a little bit after my book was published. And I, I somebody have to make an overhead of this. I was up in uh, um, Nordstrom's, and there was this great picture, a great poster of Reagan, President Reagan. So I took my book, and it stood beside him. You know, I took a picture of me and Reagan reading my book, and it looks real as hell. And I mailed these as Christmas cards in 1985, and people said, how did you get Reagan to stand with you? And then they realized, I said, no, that's not Reagan. That's a statue. It's a statue? How did you do that, you know? And this is just me and Nordstrom, so believe me, you can do this stuff. Okay, so there's this problem. We have the CIA 450. Um, now, I left out an event, which I will tell you about right now. In 1971, my mother went to Mexico with my dad for a vacation. And she's in the elevator at this hotel. And she hears this name, Zebruder. Well, there's Mrs. Zebruder in the elevator with my mom, who's now 91 and a half. And they start talking. And Mrs. Zebruder says, yes, you know, she'll agree to talk to me if, if her son calls me up. So I call up Mrs. Zebruder. And by that time, I was taping phone calls that are of, of, of potential importance. And I taped this one. 
And I listened to this tape a few years ago because I donated this. Again, it's under my deed of gift at the National Archives. But I said something like, the way the conversation was, she was kind of prissy with me. No, I don't really have time to talk to you. I'm going to the hairdresser and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, she knows what I want to talk about. And she does not want to talk about the details of the Zabruta film. And I said, well, I know you're going to hear. Can I call you another time? And I said, I really want to question you because I have the contract. You have the contract? Where did I get the contract? Well, from Ting Thompson, because he got it in that lawsuit. He, he got sued and lost all those royalties because he published these frames. And the publisher, and you know, they, they've sued. So then she talked to me for a couple of minutes. And she made some statements that I think are very significant. She talked about the fact, she said, Abe gave them the film, gave them the original. So as far as I know, when I hear that, I keep thinking of Mrs. Abruta telling me that Abe gave them the original, them being the Secret Service agents, I am sure. But the point I'm making is that these stories that he's closeted with them and these innocent explanations that have emerged, if you go to the Dallas Times, Herald, and the Dallas Morning News and the original accounts, he cannot be found. He's closeted with them somewhere. And there's something going on that evening. And, and, and as far as the wife told me, Abe gave him an original. And I believe that. So as far as I'm concerned, that original went out of the possession of, the, of Zabruder right, fairly right away. That's what Mrs. Zabruder told me. Now, maybe Abe kept a copy. But, and, and of course, he had it back by the next morning, something in a film can to, sh to sell to life. And we can talk about that, but that's another matter. Now, um, why, why alter the film? Well, the Zabruder film, in many ways, is the best evidence. And I've been through this whole business with the body. People don't, um, sometimes don't get it. They don't understand that if you, if you have the body of the president and you punch a hole in it, um, you're creating a shot, historically. I mean, if you create an entry wound, that's it. That's it. That, historically, you can have an autopsy photograph. You can have the whole thing that travels through and reverberates down the halls of history. And it's the same thing with the film. If you eliminate the car stop, it didn't stop. What you'll have is a conflict between the films. You can ignore all the witnesses. If you didn't have a Zabruta film and 15 people say the car stopped, then you've got 15 people who say the car stopped. That's the best evidence. And you start calling the, you know, the, the Secret Service. You want to know why the car stopped during the shooting. If you have a Zabruta film that doesn't show a car stop, that's not even an issue. Lawyers will tell you, oh, well, you know, witnesses. You can't trust witnesses because the film is more important than the witnesses. The film is very Orwellian, but you've got to understand the film is the best evidence. OK. So. Um, the, the, um, now, the issues of authenticity. Um, I've, uh, we, I have to skip a number of years here and go forward to the fact that as this thing emerged, uh, I'm going to go forward one year, first of all, after I had my experiences. I'm in New York City. I think, don't think I'll ever see the Zebruta film again. And somebody says to me, well, there's a guy I know. And he has these incredible color copies of the film. And you should see them if you're interested in the Kennedy assassination. So I'm invited to this party in Queens. And there at this party is this guy who won't give me his real name. And I didn't know him under his real name for about a year and a half. There was all this nonsense going on. It was Robert Groden, who insisted on only calling himself Robert Z. So he's in my address books during that period as Robert Z. And Robert Z projects on a wall the same stuff that I'd seen the year before at Life magazine and Time Life in Beverly Hills. Where'd he get it from? That's what I wanted to know. Well, it, quickly the story emerged. And Robert Z was very early on. There was very serious problems because I was making notes as he talked. And then I had to hide the fact that I was making notes because he didn't want the story to come out. And what the story was that was that this film had been at Life magazine. And Time Life subbed it out to a place called EFX in New York. And EFX um, was run by Mo Weitzman. And Mo Weitzman created, was asked by life to blow up this 8 millimeter film to, six, to, to 35. And normally you don't do that. Now I know other statements have been made here at this seminar, but I'm just stand by what I was told at the time, that at that time you couldn't go from 8 up to 35. And Mo had to design a special transport. It's not rocket science, but he had to put some time into it and go to a machine shop. And he created a special transport so you could take an 8 millimeter film, perfectly registered, and go up to a perfectly registered 35 millimeter film. And he did that. And he got 35 millimeter negatives, and there's 16 millimeters. There's a whole box of stuff you get when you do that. He, he could go up to 16, he could go up to 35. And Robert Groden subsequently came to that lab, I guess for a job or something, worked there, found one of these 35 millimeter prints on a shelf, and that's how he got involved in the Kennedy assassination. This is in the late 60s, maybe 1971, I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, well, I, at that point, then I started a relationship with Groden because I certainly wanted to, you know, hit to him to give me some stuff. And I couldn't get him to go above eight millimeter. 
And of course, he would freeze up at the notion that anything was altered on the film because this was his whole life. And in fact, that you, I, I want to point out to you why this is such a hot issue with the critics because people have invested their whole life in some view or other view of this case. Tink Thompson said when he went to Life magazine, he had this experience of looking at the absolute truth when he's looking at these frames. This is the truth. He was given this privileged position. He was on the staff. He was able to look at the truth about the Kennedy assassination. And to come back to a guy like that later and say, well, you know, this is not the truth. You're looking at a fabrication that was created by some people and they edited this out. They don't like that at all. It's, an emo it's a very hard thing for them to handle. I suppose it would be like if someone told me, um, well, the body wasn't altered. There's nothing wrong with the wounds. And I was turning, and it turned out that the Zabruta film was the truth and the body wasn't altered. I mean, it's that kind of thing. I know what that's like. I think that if somebody gave me that kind of evidence and it was really truthful evidence, I'd go where the evidence led. But a lot of people will not go where the evidence leads and they fight it. And, and Grodin definitely fought it. He wouldn't give me anything above eight millimeters. So out comes the checkbook. And I raised money and everything. And we paid Grodin and I brought my overheads with me. Um, $5,000 and signed a contract. This is in 1989 to get a lot of his material. And this is right after VHS got into the market, became a, something you could have in your home a few years afterwards. And, we, and I paid him the $5,000. We have a whole contract and I got a bunch of stuff, but he wouldn't part with celluloid or the Zapruder film. Is this 79 or 89? 89. 89. 89. Yeah. And I have the, I brought them with me, uh, but I'll show you. I have some other overheads that are more important than these canceled checks, but I wanted to show them. Because, I, because he went around saying I never paid him any money and I have these canceled checks and I used to bring them with me wherever we would go of these Xerox copies of these checks <laughs> because we would be on radio programs and I don't want to have these charges made against me. So, uh, and, well, I might as well turn on the overhead. I don't know how it works. But anyway, is this it? Yep. And I want to tell you about the, the film and let's uh, just... I'll look the same question. 89, you said before we had... Huh? Quick question. The, the year, what year was it? The, the, the payments and the money to Grodin is 89. So you're saying something about before VHS was in homes? Yeah, the VHS was in homes, uh, well, except for Betamax, because I remember when it happened, uh, the, the big VHS, what they call the penetration of the, you know, the, of, the, of, the, of the market, was in the early 80s, about 83 or 84. If you go to 79, you can get a very expensive machine. Some people could afford a Betamax, but 89 for the, trans 89 for the transaction. In what year? What? You had a Betamax. No, an RCA. An RCA VHS? Uh, RCA VHS. It was, when was that? Well, I can tell you this because I remember when it happened, huh? 78, 79. Yeah. 70, 79. Yeah. And I taped, I taped it all off the air. I, that, I'm not saying. Oh, I'm not saying there was no VHS. I'm not saying. Okay. I'm not saying there was no video recorders, but they were. Not everybody had them. It wasn't today like you go into Best Buy. They were very expensive. So what paid thousand dollars? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. It was not the com right. Very. Not everybody had them. It was a luxury item. Okay. What's the relevance of the date 1979, 1980? Oh. Um. I don't. I didn't understand the reference to VHS. Oh. Um, oh, because by the, by the time the, when we hit the mid-80s, I had already the filmed interviews of the autopsy witnesses. And the question was how to get them out to the public. And that's when I made the video, uh, my video. And, and it became easy to argue to, argue to present a case to a distributor. In fact, I was approached about re releasing material. The, the idea of Blockbuster, that whole phenomenon of video stores where you could release, go to a distributor, get financing, that's not something that's, that happens until the mid-80s. And that's... That's, and that's what I'm talking about. Okay. So then it became viable that this is the way you could get financing for something. So, um, well, this tells the story of how an 8 millimeter film was made into 35 millimeter print. You have your 30, by Mo Weitzman, you have a special optical printer, you go to 35, then this is an internegative. So if you are privileged to look at a 35 millimeter of the Zapruder film, and I was, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, in New York City, where I, had the, where I did this work for about a week, that's an interpositive, uh, excuse me, an internegative. You're looking at everything in reverse colors. And you've got to know the Zebruder film, which I you know, know well enough to do it in reverse, but it's, it's a real Rorschach experience. And then you have to, then you make a 35 millimeter interpositive from that on the optical printer. And then from the interpositive, you go to a 
printing into negative, excuse me, printing negative and you get a 35 millimeter print or whatever you want. And here you can do a reduction print and you can get a 16 millimeter positive print if you do it a reversal. Um, well, no, you go through a negative first. Well, anyway, I just wanted to show that it, you get into all these rolls of film. You're in front of the same machine that he showed yesterday, David Healy showed with, um, what's his name? Um, what's the guy's name? Lin, Linwood Dunn. I was in that same kind of machine. It's this huge Rube Goldberg device. I'm not a Linwood Dunn, obviously. And, and they liquid gate it. What, liquid gate means that they put liquid in the transport of the lens mechanism of the same index refraction as the emulsion on the film to eliminate the scratches and it, it helps make a clearer print. So all this stuff is floating around there and you're wearing a cloth over your nose because it's acetone and you're breathing in these fumes and, and, then, and that's when I did all this work. This is, well, I'll come to that in a minute. That's in 1990. Okay, so meanwhile, here's another flow chart. Um, and I saw this in life on June 22nd, 1970, when John Costella was three and three quarter years old. <laughs> right? Exactly. I was trying to place our timeline. Okay. So I'll just give you a sense of the uh, flow of time here. So, and of course then it was a year later that I found Grodin had all this stuff. Whoops, and wouldn't, you know, basically make it available. And here are the, I just, this is a personal point, I just have to show you. Here are the checks I wrote, Grodin. <laughs> and, uh, Reason, I mean, I would show these to people who would say the only reason I didn't give these Xerox copies of the checks to Robert Gordon was I was afraid he'd try to cash them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we made a contract too. And these are just, I'm not going to get into it because time is valuable, but these are, we have clauses. He gave me all this stuff because this is before it became, we have witnesses and everything. Okay, now, yeah. Um, Grodin had this materials, and he is not letting go of it. And you cannot argue for inauthenticity unless you get the materials to look at. Well, Nova did a show in 1988, and you all know something about it. And I was on the show, and I played a major role in the show, and they gave me a third of the show to argue my case for body and wound alteration. And Bob Richter, the, the producer of this show, had a 35 millimeter of the kind that I just showed you on the flow chart. He had one of them from Mo Weitzman, because Richter and Weitzman were friends. And Grodin had this idea that he's going to collect. He's got this idea. He's going to control the event. It's like capturing all the pictures of the bombing of Pearl Harbor or something. He will not let go. And it's a really serious problem, because he had the evidence. And it's still a serious problem. This is crucial evidence, folks. This is the, the copies that were made in 1966 or 7 by Mo Weitzman under Contract to Life magazine. They are really important. And there's one extant copy. Bob Richter had it. I said, Bob, you've got to let me have this thing. He wouldn't, he was afraid of a lawsuit, and there's all these legal people about to sue each other and all these problems when you get into the, close to the trunk of this tree. So Richter put it at a lab, and that's when I went into the lab and spent my time working at this lab for a week. And it cost about ten or twelve thousand dollars. And I had five or six researchers who put up the money, fifteen hundred apiece, so I could work on this film. And I sat there and made 35 millimeter uh, interpositives. I didn't just not copy it once, and I blew up the area of the head snap, and I blew up the front seat, and I blew up Governor Connolly, and I did all this work so I could study this thing and get a better idea of it. And then I made a slip of the tongue after I, some week after I left, because I couldn't resist in one of my conversations with Grodin mentioning this. And he just really was livid and got, and got um, Mo Weitzman on the phone, and Weitzman called up Richter and demanded under threat of a lawsuit that they return that copy immediately. And that went back, that went back to Weitzman, who has this father-son relationship with Grodin, and gave it to Grodin. And it's gone into the Grodin black hole. And we asked, we asked, I mean, when I, the AWRB came around, um, I worked very heavily with Jeremy Gunn and some of those people, and especially Doug Horn, um, to get Grodin under oath and to subpoena him. And he, they were not happy with his questions, uh, answers under oath, because he kept saying he didn't have this and he didn't have that. And finally, um, we, I sent Jeremy this fax one day, and uh, it says, I'm sorry, Mr. Gunn, my dog ate them. And so the problem we have today, and this is not just a personal thing, this guy has all this material, and now he's claiming that this woman he was married to stole it. I mean, he's got an excuse. He's created a whole legend for why he doesn't have it. But this is really important stuff. Now, what about authenticity? I want to talk about that for a minute. Not for a minute, just because this is a very important part. 
of this whole thing. Here's what we're really saying happened. We're saying what happened basically is that originally there was a original and originally they went to Jameson Film Company and made these three copies, C1, C2, and C3. And went back and processed them and all that. Then we're saying that somebody got a hold of that original and we're talking now the Secret Service that night. Somebody hands it over to some optical genius and we'll talk about who that genius may be in a minute or where it comes from. And they've got to go and create this new, this new thing, O prime, not O, O is the original. They create O prime and O prime is our edited film. And from O prime they strike three corresponding copies, C1 prime, C2 prime and C3 prime and you've got to look at it this way. And O prime and C1 prime are sold to life. Okay, that's the, excuse me, I, yeah, O prime, that's the Zebruder. He retains a copy. So he has a copy and there's O prime and the copy from O prime go to life and C2 prime and C3 prime go to the Secret Service. And from there on, we don't have to worry about it. I mean, they do make a copy, the FBI gets a copy, but let's not worry about what happens downstream. Later in 1967, as I've told you, O prime goes back to EFX laboratories in New York and is blown up from eight. But on November 22nd, and that weekend, you have to understand, they did not slit the film. That's in the testimony. And Forrest Sarr, it's a big point made in the documents I gave the AWRB. Somebody was savvy enough to say, don't slit the film. So it's a 16 millimeter double perf. And that's very important because it makes it easier to work with on an optical printer if it's 16. I'm not talking about, you know, forget about printer technology today. Forget about what happened years later. In 1963, if you don't slit the film, you're saving yourself a lot of problems because you can go onto a 16 millimeter printer. And then you got track A and track B. Track A is the family side, track B is the assassination side. Now, um, the problem faced by these folks um, is this basic problem. If you just view it from the standpoint of the car stop. And it's basically that, and I'm, I'm not trying to be mathematically ac accurate. This is just to make a point about a conception. Do you guys have a red pointer with a little, yeah. with a little hole? The velocity drops to zero if you believe these witnesses. And not only does the velocity drop to zero momentarily, thanks. Sure. Thanks, I just pressed the, sure. where do you, where is it? Um, okay. Not only does the velocity drop to zero, um, people kind of oversimplify this. They tend to think that, you know, you have this event, you can just cut it out and butt A against B. That's not the way it works. Because when you smooth this out, um, you've got to do a selection of frames, you might say, and you've got to smooth it out. You've got to do a selection of the subset of what's already there. And I didn't make an overhead of this, but I will just read you. And I know that, I mean, obviously, this is duck soup to John Costello. But the famous formula you learn, and I'm going to just put this on the board, because I think you have to make this concrete so people will understand what's going on here. The famous formula you all learn, because the question is, how many frames are missing anyway? So the famous formula you all learn is one, S equals one half AT squared, which is distance. Let's put distance. Well, I like S, okay. S equals one half AT squared. You solve for T, and you get T equals square root of two, and the square root of the distance, that's S over A. Now you can start playing with this any which way you want. How long did it take the car to stop? That's S. And what's the acceleration? I mean, this is not a Ford crash test. I mean, is it G? Is it 2G? Could Mrs. Connolly take a half a G? I mean, I don't know. But pretty quickly, you get to the point that when you solve for T, you're up to the area of three and a half seconds to seven seconds. I mean, you can't stop a two-ton vehicle and then get back up to speed in less than seven, in less than three and a half to seven seconds. No matter what you have for your time, you have to double it because you've got to get back up to speed. And suddenly you're dealing with three and a half, four, five, six, seven, eight seconds, and just roughly at 20 frames a second, you're talking about 160 frames, 200 frames. It's a very, very big deletion, this event of the car stop. And people don't understand, you don't just delete 20 frames and eliminate the stop. You've got to smooth it out. And it's got to look credible. So what are we going to do about this? And how do you ever prove something like this? Well, how are you going to test for authenticity? And this is really important, and this has been already discussed here. Where is my point? Oh, here. Okay. It's already been discussed here that you have side A and side B, and you paste them edge to edge. And this is why an 8 millimeter film is actually one half of a 16 millimeter, and how 25 foot of 16 becomes 50 foot of 8. Okay, you know that. And what I brought with me, I hope, is an overhead here. Because 
I was on the phone with the AWRB during this whole thing because I realized what the stakes are here and we're trying to get them to do the proper tests and Doug Horn is trying to get them to do the proper tests and it turns out that what's really critical well first of course I said to them look I was on the optical printer I was on the optical printer and I saw that thing jump after 315 there's something going on there and I know we had this discussion last night briefly, so I don't want to pursue it until last night. I really believed, and I still believe something's going on, that the experience I had in having to reset the optical printer, the image flew off the screen, that because truly said he saw the car swerve to the left. Something's going on there, and if the mathematics are done and this is re-examined, I think you're going to find something. But I'm not going to make my case on that this morning, which is what I believed unequivocally until last night when I'm hearing that everything's you know fine and dandy in that area which is that I think they were, you know, created an image that is greater than full zoom. They did something that on the optical printer caused me to have to constantly reset the controls after 315 as if I'm trying to reel in a fish optically. I mean, this thing is on the street and I'm having a lot of troubles keeping it centered. So something is there, I don't know what. So it has to be further investigated. But this I will go to the bank with, which is that, okay, which is the, okay. this. Basically, when you make a copy of a film, when you make a copy, they mask the sprocket hole area. And so what you get is just these, you know, the frames over here. And Groden and I used to argue about this, because once he understood that I was going after the authenticity, I mean, he just, we went through this a hundred times. And he swore up and down that he operates those optical printers, which he does, and that the only way you can get into the sprocket hole area is if you're at the original film. And therefore, since the original has sprocket hole information, um, so it's really an original. It was made in the Bell and Howell camera. This was our, our, his argument. And that if it was a copy, you'd only have this area to the right. And so as far as he was concerned, it was open and shut. I was wrong. There was no way. Well, when we look at this closely, and, and many of you have, you understand that the image goes way out to the left. It goes right out flush left in some of the frames. It really goes out to the left. Well, does it go that far out to the left? Well, no, it doesn't when you take an original. Turns out, and, and Roly Zavada started getting into this, um, if you go into full zoom, you can get somewhat into that area, but you don't go flush left. And, that, and so that becomes your test for authenticity. If you start having frames that are all the way out to the left, flush left, with image, well, can you do that in the Zebruder camera? Roly couldn't. And he kept doing test after test after test. And he writes these paragraphs in his report to try to explain this. And he took pictures of his wife in Dealey Plaza because we're hammering away at him. Doug is, and I spoke to Roly once or twice. And he repeatedly said to me, I did not test the film for authenticity. Now, I don't know what he's saying today. I don't know what he said before Simpty and all that and how they promoted it. But that's what he told me. And Jeremy Gunn was afraid to ask for the original camera. Because, why? Because the New York Times would hear from Gary Mack or somebody that they're investigating the assassination. They're not supposed to be investigating the assassination. So when you go out, so the question becomes, if, it, if you need image in the sprocket hole area and, you're, and you've done an optical edit and you're up in 35 millimeter and you do a reduction print, how do you get image over in this area on the left-hand side? Well, that's really a problem. And for that reason, um, as it's been explained to me, and I had the guy in New York who rented me that equipment that week, that lab, he said you'd have to make two passes. You'd make one pass down the main highway, and then you got to do a second pass for your optical information in the sprocket hole area. And, that, and all you guys talking about ghost images, that's what that's all about. I mean, sure, it's interesting to analyze what's in there, and I, and I, and I laud you for looking for all that detail. But macroscopically, what you're looking at is the second pass, and that's why you have that line that goes down there on those 35 millimeter excuse me, on the prints, and you're looking at it, it has a different contrast, because they made two passes on an optical printer. That's what it looks like to me. You've got one lane of the highway joined to the other lane of the highway, and that is because somebody is aware, not somebody, anybody, who's got an IQ above room temperature in that business knows that you've got to have image over in the left um, for it to be an original. You can't produce, you can't produce this and say that that's an original. That's a joke. Nobody's going to buy that. You've got to have image in the left. Well, somebody overdid it, and they didn't realize that years later there's going to be a bunch of eager beavers like us saying, well, how far to the left? And Roly Zavada filming his wife in Dealey Plaza and saying, well, I can't get it to go that far. I'm on full zoom. That's what maximizes the left and most margin, by the way. I'm on full zoom, and I still can't get it. And he couldn't get it, and he could not do it. Now, there's something else about the film I want to tell you. Um, yeah. 
I've got a frame up here that, that we generally speak put with the, uh, one of his cameras. Yeah. It goes just about all the way to the left. That's going to have to be analyzed. You're going to have to see how often that happens. You're going to have to see, does it happen on every single frame? Because that, because Rowley couldn't do it. And I mean, and I think this is a subject that's very serious and you have to really, you have to really, I'm saying this is, an, this is one of the key indices of authenticity, is this business. If you can just take an eight millimeter camera and go down there and get it flushed, the Ro, all I'm saying, Rowley Zavada repeatedly doing this on full zoom and he publishes these things in the Zavada report, one of the appendices. And well, and I'm sorry to say that although I have to leave in 32 minutes or whatever, 35 minutes, this is an area that's really important. And so I would say, how many times were you able to get it? Rowley couldn't do it. Um, I'm not saying it's completely impossible to get one frame or whatever, but I'm interested. He couldn't get it. He couldn't get it. Huh? That's not flush left. Well, it's a fair way. Not, yeah, okay, but fairway is not good enough. On some of these, on, on what I'm saying is that on the film that purports to be the original, really critical. That's it. Real, real, okay, huh? That's it. And so you guys, because I'm writing yeah, about. I agree. Huh? I agree. Good, thanks. You guys got to go make your graph and see how many, you know, what percentage to the left, because Rowley couldn't do it, and he and Doug Horn and I were in this ongoing argument about this, and it yeah. couldn't be done. They couldn't do it. Hey, Rush. Okay. Now. Great. Let me, and I want to point out another thing, because I've got a bunch of topics I want to discuss here that are all connected with this. What is the role of this Rochester lab? Why do these people come in? And I just looked at the documents again last night. And they come in and say, this film, I'm Secret Service agent Bill Smith, which is, you know, you know, I'm, you know, Joe Friday. I come in from, Ro I've come in from Rochester with the original print here. You've got to, I want you to make these internegatives. What's Rochester have to do with all this? Well, I'd like to tell, tell you what my opinion of what Rochester has. I think this was done fairly quickly, but nonetheless, it does take a few days. I spoke to Mo Weitzman about this. How long does it take you? This is before Robert Groden poisoned my relationship with Weitzman, but I was speaking with Weitzman, went up to his office, had a conversation with him, sat down with him, he said two hours per frame in terms of altering wound information. The rest is, you know, much different. It's, it's much easier to do. Altering wound information, you know, the, the, the multiple match you're talking about, he said, nah, two hours per frame. Well. They want that film, they have, some, they have to have something back the next morning. So I don't doubt for a minute that there's intermediate prints made of this thing. Now here's the problem. The original's on Kodachrome 2 stock. This is not Ektachrome. You know, you can't go to one hour photo or the equivalent in 1963. And I don't know if there was an equivalent. Ekta, a Kodachrome is a special process. And there's a, there's a limited number of labs in the United States. And I don't know the exact number, but I think it's about six. One is in Dallas at the airport. I'm sure one is in New York. Maybe one is in Chicago, one is in Atlanta. Okay. Um, you can't go back to Dallas with your Kodachrome 2, you know, print your intermediate thing you've edited and say, oh, I'm Mr. Chandler, I'd like you to process the Zach Ruder film. Oh, we did that on Friday. We can't run the Zach Ruder film. How did you get, what are, we, what are we doing with an unprocessed Zach Ruder film? Mr. Zach Ruder was in here two days ago with this film. We processed it already, you know. So you have to find a lab somewhere. And there's one lab where they can do this. And it's up in Rochester and is connected with the national security apparatus of the United States government. And when Bill, when Bill Smith, the Secret Service agent, said, and came down and, and told Homer McMahon and those people that he was at this lab, he was at this special lab. And he, he told them the name and everything. And Doug put the name in the reports and it's on the tape. And then the CIA instructed the AWRB to erase the name, to delete it. So Doug had to do an audio edit. And so in the public conversations, I refer to it as Eagle Eye Works. I don't give a damn anymore if the government wants to sue me. I'm going to tell you what the name is. It's called Hawkeye Works. Hawkeye Works is the secret government lab that does the Corona film projects. And Hawkeye Works was making this reduction print, I guess, for the Zapruder film. So, so in order to put this on K2 stock for purposes of work that weekend, Whenever they needed an 8 millimeter on, on, on Kodachrome 2 stock, somebody has to do a K2 print. And you can't do it at the local drugstore. You just can't. You have to go to a lab. And it's already been in Dallas. And I mean, I mean, you can see these guys with pins on their mouth. No. So they went to Rochester. And that's Hawkeye Works. And I'm sure, I mean, and that's the one incident we know about. There may have been other in, prints that are made on K2 stock through the Kodachrome 2 processing, uh, which is a very patented, um, complica complicated event. OK. So that's what Rochester has to do with it. When I think of Rochester today, I think of the place where they went 
to get a K2 print. That's what Rochester's all about. It's not necessarily at all the place where this film was altered. The stuff that David Healy talks about, and David and I have gotten to know each other a little bit on the phone, that has, to do, that has to be done in a place with optical printers, and not just optical printers, special effects guys. Somebody in the special effects department has to be able to, has to, be able to do that kind of work. And um, um, now, there's more. Um, that means to me that if the car stopped during the shooting and you've got a political, you've got a political problem, that means to me that Lyndon Johnson has to pick up the phone and call Abe Fortas or somebody like that and say, we, need, we have a problem. Because why? Because we've got this guy that has this film and we've got to edit it. Okay, I know just the guy for you. And they put him in touch with whoever the guy is. And I, I strongly believe that it's somebody in Hollywood now. I don't know. I don't have a name. And David and I were talking. And he talked about Lynn Wood's site in Dallas or Houston. I find less probable. It could have happened, but it's less probable. The place to go is Los Angeles and, and the Hollywood film industry. And I just want to point out, and there are two things you, I want you, uh, points I want to make here, that the person who was Johnson's right arm on Air Force One, right there, is Jack Valenny, who was a Houston advertising man who's up to his neck in planning this trip. Believe me, I know all about it. It's not all been released yet. I have letters and stuff. Valenny's involved in planning this trip. I'm not saying he's involved in the murder. He may have been used by somebody. He's Congressman Al Thomas's assistant and a Houston advertising man. Valenny goes back to the White House that night. He's with Johnson until he goes to sleep. You'll read about it in the memoirs. He says, don't even go home. You're going to buy your clothing here. You're staying at the White House. You're my appointee. And after a certain period when she's in on every meeting having to do with Vietnam and everything else, because he's holding Johnson's hand through the opening year and a half of the presidency, or two, whatever it is, he then leaves the White House and is made or is invited to be president of the Motion Picture Association of America. And you folks from the normal areas of America, not LA, but from Minnesota and the lakes and Lake Wobegon and all the rest, don't understand how important that is. That's the most powerful position. In, I mean, you, can, you don't cross Jack Valenny. That's a really important position. So it would be like um, finding someone, Johnson appoints someone or his top aide becomes someone who has control over Commander Humes, Admiral Boswell, and Galloway. That would mean the same thing in the area of film as I'm telling you this means in the area of the body, okay? The film and the body are the two most important things here. And for Valenny to end up in charge of the motion picture industry, if you want to know why nothing's happened in 35 years and why no special effects person has come forward, I suspect, I just deeply suspect that has something to do with it. Because I've had many conversations with people in Alley. We, we sit for hours talking about this. Well, who do you know? Who do you know? Who was, in the, who was at RKO? Who was this one? Because Hollywood and Washington are like this. So when, when Lyndon learns he has a political problem and they have to do something with films, believe me, they know, you know, they can know pretty quickly who to go to, whether it's a Lou Wasserman or somebody else. But somebody's got to take that phone call and say, I, I can help you out. You know, I need an airplane. I got to either fly my men and their equipment, which is unlikely, I think, or I got to get that film out here. One way or the other, this was accomplished. Now, you cannot alter the Zabruta film without altering the Knicks film and others. And I want to just point out some other things. That early on, when I was doing my work on this, I found that the FBI or the Secret Service, I don't know which one it was, but it's in the Dallas newspapers, put notices in boxes at the ANSCO plant and at the Kodak plant. Anybody who took any pictures that day, if you have anything having to do with the shooting of President Kennedy, bring your film in. And I believe you can actually get that article. I, I know I have it somewhere. I've seen it. Um, so they're doing a net already. They're looking for all the films. And this idea of putting out a word, putting out the word, is very important. Now, when you're arguing and debating with someone like a Gary Mack, um, they say, what about the next film? Well, I'm just saying it's the responsibility, to a certain extent, in the research community to really get a good Nix file going. And I had one. I remember Nix. I remember the motion picture footage Mark Lane took of Nix. He said, I got my film back from the Secret Service. Forrest Sorrells was a friend of mine, he said. And there were splices in it and stuff. Um, that's the Nix film. I, I haven't trusted the Nix film since I saw that account. So yeah, with a wave of the hand, I say, well, they must have gotten to the Nix film. The Much More film, I'm sure, has an equivalent story. I'd like to know the details of Marie Much More, when she first you know, if you speak to Gary Mack, well, they couldn't have known. They dropped it in the night drop. Well, if I was the CIA or something, I'd sure as hell look in the night drop to see what films were there that night. And somebody's got to be doing that kind of work. Um, it's not possible, what I'm saying, is to alter one film and not alter them all. There either was or was not an attempt to get the civilian films in Dealey Plaza because things happened during this assassination. And I'm citing the car stop as the, you know, Exhibit A that had to be dealt with. And you can't let one film slip through the net. 
I've told you about the Hollywood connection. Um, there's more. I want to make sure that, oh yeah, I want to talk about the film leader. The, the number, and if you're an attorney, I mean, you know, people like myself, and I don't want to compare, I mean, I'm really impressed with John's presentation yesterday and all the mathematics, but I just urge you all, it wouldn't hurt to get a book on evidence and read through it and understand the way lawyers look at, look at these things, because lawyers look at these things in a certain way, and the media follows the lawyers in this country. And so, when you have, um, they, they all are interested in things like chain of possession. If you talk authenticity to them and you stay within that legal ballpark, they'll listen to you. You know, if you show them the hours of mathematics you did, and you kept your computer running all night and show them that the sign thing doesn't match, I, I just don't want to tell you what they're going to say. They're going to, their eyes are going to roll up, and, and you're going to walk away from the interaction, and you're going to say, well, they just don't understand mathematics, and they're going to say, I don't understand you, and your story is not going to get very much credibility. But if you have an argument about, if you stay within the legal ballpark, you're okay. Now, I just want to tell you something about the legal ballpark. 0183 is the leader number punched on, on the film the original. And I want you to know where it's punched. Remember when I put up the thing um, of how a 16 millimeter film becomes an 8, uh, excuse me, yeah, an 8 of 50 feet long. And this is, I wanted to show this so it's, okay, this is worth just taking a second to find. Uh, here. Oh. Okay. Here it is. Okay, now, I want you to know where the number, this is the number, where it goes. The number of the film that they punch, 01, 081, and all that stuff, goes at the end of side B. That's where the lab puts it normally. Not on side A, I know this may look a little bit counterintuitive, but this is where it goes, after the end of side B. Okay, I guess it's after it runs through the processor. Okay. Well, first of all, the film we have, the so-called original, does not have L183 on it. Forget it, okay? Then you have your three copies. Remember, we talked about C1, C2, and C3. One of those copies has the number 0186. That's Secret Service copy two. Well, I mean, Doug was really on this when he's on the ARRB and he's pushing Jeremy and they're talking to Rolly Zavada. Guess what? Secret Service copy two, which has the 0186 number, yeah, it has 0186. It's at the beginning of side A, first of all. And second of all, it's a picture of it. You can see the splice there, so someone stuck it on there. You can't get away with this in a court of law when you're talking authenticity. This is a joke. This is like seeing the incision for surgery. I mean, if 0186 is pasted, is not pasted on, but is spliced on photographically to side A, it's in the wrong place, A, and B, the splice is visible. And uh, what does Rolly Zavada do about this? I went over this thing with Doug Horn, and it got very complicated last week. I was sitting in Starbucks with a headset on, on the cell phone, and he, and he and I were going over how to make this thing um, intelligible. You not only know it's in the wrong place, he said, you can see where they stuck it on, the splice is copied photographically, and it's in the wrong place. That's a big deal. You can tell that to the lawyer, and you can start arguing that point, and it's an important point. And Roly Zavada has to deal with it. Um, He wrote sentences like this. This special handling of the film at the Dallas laboratory did allow a non-typical placement of the perforated identification. Says who? That's Rolly Zavada, what, from Kodak? He, I mean, you know, you gotta cross-examine that kind of thing. Find me the lady who did it. Show me, tell me why. You know, of course she's passed on in that, but I'm saying this is the nature of the problem you're dealing with. You can't just take these authentication indicators for granted. So yeah, I think this film has been altered. And I want to tell you another story, what happened during the ARRB investigation. They wanted to uh, get this business of shooting at full zoom, zoom from the uh, Zebruder pedestal. So the ARRB is afraid of it, and they're afraid to ask Gary Mack. And I mean, you couldn't believe that the effect, their, their worry about Gary Mack in this investigation. So Rowley had purchased three or four cameras at garage sales. So they said, okay, we'll start with a camera from a garage sale, a perfectly operating camera. And they sent Tom Samalock down to Dallas to do it. And Rowley FedExed him the camera, and he's given the instructions. And Samalock's down there, and he's pulling the trigger, and it doesn't work. He can't get the thing to operate. Anyway, he blew it. He went back to the airport, and he's phoning them up, and he's telling them that it doesn't work. And Samalock doesn't have any education in this matters. So Rowley asks him, or Doug asks him, well, did you wind the camera? 
No. So he kept telling them that the camera was jammed. He said, I can't, this camera won't operate. You gave me a no good camera. It doesn't operate. You have to wind it. Duh, you know? <laughs> this is what happened. This is the kind of investigation we had. Government the government, good enough for government work. I don't know. I, I th no, he sent it to him with the film in it. <laughs> okay, ghost image. Let me just go through some certain points because there's another really big one coming up. Ghost images. You now know my view of the left margin. It's a very fertile area for work because uh, eagle eye is Hawkeye works. Zavada to me on numerous occasions. I did not check for authenticity. Oh, now I want to talk about money. The Zabruta family. Um, I have, I mean, I don't think the is involved in this, what do you call it, before the fact at all. I want you to know that, but I want you to talk about their behavior since. They refused to designate, they, they fought the idea that the copy of the Zabruder film, the Dallas duplicate, the one that he retained, C1 Prime, they refused to have that, they didn't want that designated an assassination record. Okay, and then and they, they claimed they didn't have it, and then Doug went up to the office of Silverberg and he found it at the last minute and everything, and then, I mean, so it exists. Why didn't they want it as, as an assassination record? Why do they want it as their personal property? Well, I'll tell you why. Now we're dealing with money here. I don't even need a blackboard for this. I think you can all understand when we get into the millions. Okay, they got $16 million for this thing. But they owned the duplicate, right? That was never an assassination record. So they were now able to donate the duplicate to the sixth floor museum, okay? How much is the duplicate work worth? Well, the original is 16 million through a process of legislation, the free market and all that. So I don't know what they got for it, 10 million? That's the write-off. The duplicate became the tax shelter for the price they were paid for the original. So instead of being taxed on $16 million by donating the duplicate, and claiming it had a value that was, let's say, 80% or 70%, name your percentage, their tax liability went down from 16 million to maybe 6 million. I mean, this is with our, the records that I think belong to all of us. Anyway, now, there's something else I really want to talk about, and this is really important also. Um, the Dallas Morning News plays a very important role in this whole business. Because they, Ed Dealey's newspaper is almost like the propaganda output for the lone assassin story and the story of Kennedy going to the hospital and all the rest of it. I mean, the New York Times people are right there in those offices using those typewriters, etc. When you see an unbylined story in the Dallas Morning News, you get, I get real suspicious. Like, who wrote that? Who's putting that into the media? But then there are some stories that are not unbylined, but at least run on the AP wire, but they come out of Dallas. They don't have a byline. We don't know how they got there. Okay. Very early on, and I think, my personal belief is that as soon as that film was processed, and they realized they had a problem. So I differ a little bit about with the idea that, that they planned in advance to, to do a complete fabrication. I'm, I'm not saying I will never go there. I'm just saying I'm not there now. And uh, my, my view is still Lyndon Johnson picking up the phone, Abe Fortas, who do I go to, you know, get me the film, blah, blah, blah. But by Sunday night, they're getting control of this event. And they are now creating a new version of it on film. And you have to very carefully track the stories that are put out. Now, we all know the famous Life magazine story with the president you know, turning around to expose his throat. And we think of that, well, that's the early one. They made a mistake, it's, you know, throat when he's turning around. I found an earlier one, and this is really important because these things are a matter of records, and lawyers and journalists can respect this stuff. You give them a document, they understand where it comes from. They can look it up, they can read it in a microfilm. This is Dallas AP, November 25. It moves, this story moves at 12.02 in the morning on the day of the funeral, 12.02 a.m. A strip of color movie film graphically depicting the assassination of President Kennedy was made by a Dallas clothing manufacturer. Several persons in Dallas who have seen the film, you don't let them get away with that. Who? Who's writing this story? What's this several persons in Dallas who have seen the film business, which lasts about 15 seconds, say, it clearly shows how the president was hit in the head with shattering force by the second of two bullets fired by the assassin. This is what the film, made by Abe Zabruder, is reported to show. First, the president limousine comes abreast of the camera. As it comes abreast of the photographer, Kennedy is hit by the first bullet, okay, apparently in the neck. He turns towards his wife, Jacqueline, seated at his left, and she quickly begins to put her arms around, the president, uh, around his head. At the same time, Connolly of Texas, riding directly in front, turns around to see what has happened. Then, this is a second event, 
Then Kennedy is hit on the upper right side of the back of his head with violent force. Headshot is the second shot. His head goes forward and then snaps back. This is the little 312, 313 business, which it took Richard Feynman to find. You know, AP knows about it on November 25th at 2 o'clock, you know, 2 minutes after midnight. His head goes forward and then snaps back. At this time, Governor Connolly is wounded in the shoulder and drops forward and his seat. So you've got in this version on Sunday night, Kennedy 1, Kennedy 2, Connolly. Now, Obviously, there's another version circulating, and maybe the interview to, with Paul Mandel was that same weekend, and he had a different version where they were going to, you know, have Kennedy turn around and look at the depository. And as I was remarking to my friend at breakfast, maybe there was a phone conversation that says, oh, yeah, we can have Kennedy turning around. Do you want the film by Easter? You know? You can do anything. <laughs> we can do anything, as David Healy says. But so they have Kennedy, Kennedy, Connolly. Now, there's something more important even about this article. As a person who studied the medical evidence for a number of decades, I know the code words now, and I know the language, okay? Here's the way this thing worked. Kennedy's body is a piece of evidence that is going to be controlled after his death. And you have two Secret Service agents riding in the follow-up car, and I respectfully disagree with those who take some of these accounts seriously, because they're, these people, as far as I'm concerned, are involved in a plot to murder the President of the United States. One of them got files a report. I saw him hit below the shoulder. That's six inches down, you know. The other one says, I saw him hit, and this is George Hickey, in the upper right-hand side of his head. Now, this is not, forget about the body for the moment on the autopsy table. This is what, this is the way they verbally describe the autopsy photos, which is another record. This is an important historical record. The autopsy photos. When you hear about a wound hitting the top right-hand side of the president's head, that's the autopsy photo description. So you've got them moving on the wire at 12.02 on Friday, 11.25, the George Hickey Secret Service agent report. It's almost the same words on the upper right side of the back of his head. Now, I just discovered this on the way out here. I was saying, oh my God, I used to use the Paul Mandel story. This is even better. So you've got this conflict. Now, what is the problem here? Why can't these guys get it right? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. First of all, you all know, of course, that the film created a problem with the single bullet theory, if you believe Connolly shot up the street, which I'm not so sure about anymore. But anyway, be that as it may, here's the problem. They write, right, first of all, they have a three-shot scenario by this time. But there's a problem out there. The problem is there's the missed shot. That's the curb. Now, I don't know the exact date that the curb problem is discovered and becomes part of the paperwork in this case. But I remember very clearly reading a, an early December 63 story, again, in the Dallas Morning News on Byline, where they float the idea that one bullet maybe hit two people. Because you see, if you have the curb shot, if you have Kennedy, Kennedy, Connolly, and then you have the curb. Then you have a fourth shot. Well, guess what? Only three shells are found. And of course, we all know there's a problem. Maybe it wasn't three shells. Maybe it was two made into three. But the point is, the curb adds a fourth shot. And you can't just keep adding ammunition to this thing as other impacts arise. So um, the, the, the film, of course, as we all know, once you decide that you're going to have Kennedy and Connolly hit by the same bullet and put out that story, um, that, I think, is necessitated uh, not only by the timing problem, but you see, when you shift the Connolly hit to between the Kennedy two hits, you have Kennedy one and Kennedy two. And when you put Connolly in there, then you've got your timing problem, then you've got your single bullet theory trajectory. But the reason why you've got to hit, you've got to shift the Connolly hit into between the Kennedys is because you've got this curb stone that's turned up. That's hit also. That's a fourth shot. And politically, that's dynamite. You have to understand, in 1963, you can't have a second assassin and have a political transition from Kennedy to Johnson that's fluid and easy. It's not going to work. Um, that creates a major problem. Now, the other point I wanted to address is that you're saying, well, who is this film made for? The Warren Commission. I beg to differ. We don't know, I don't know who this film was made for. This film was made for whichever legal investigation turned out to be the one. Because in the beginning, that Johnson didn't want a Warren Commission. Let me tell you the stages they went through. First, there was, well, we can just have an FBI investigation. That's the FBI from Hoover. They were considered the last word in 1963. Well, guess what? The American public wouldn't stand for that. Then it was, well, we'll have a Texas, or the Texas court of... Uh, a people's, uh, some kind of a Texas uh, People's Court or something, a Texas a special investigation run by the Attorney General. Well, the Eastern Seaboard howled. What do you mean, Texas, you know? And that's when they started saying, okay, we're going to have to have a commission. So, yes, yeah, subsequently it became to be something that has to go to the Warren Commission. But if you go to FBI memoirs, like Carthur Deloche, I believe, he sees a film that weekend. And um, they talk about the violent forward snap. Well, maybe there was an intermediate version where they hadn't cleaned it up yet. Maybe Dan Rather is not completely lying. Maybe he sees that intermediate version. I don't know. These are unanswered questions I have. Um, but I do know that this is George Hickey's language. And this is moving on the wire. And you can take this to the bank, that George Hickey said what he said in the Secret Service report about the head wound in the same language is used here. 
and you've got Kennedy, Kennedy, Connolly. So this is, in terms of tracking this, this is where we are as of Sunday night. So, have I... Can I get into print? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, hold it. Let me back up. I got this off an AP microfiche years ago working at the UCLA library. That is, uh, I presume it was published somewhere, but, I, but it's on a microfiche. And it's A176 paren BX FW close paren. And it's designated story A176 DN. And it moved to 1202. But that's a good question. And I'd love to have it in print. But what's great about it is that we have a microfilm record of what they were moving on the AP. Um, so um, I, I don't know if there's any easy way to sum up a talk like this. I think the film was altered. I think special effect technology was used. I don't know exactly where it was done. I suspect there's a Los Angeles connection. When they needed Kodachrome 2 prints, they went to Rochester. We have one instance of that at least. Um, that's the reason for it, because they can't show up and give somebody an ectochrome and end up having it in somebody's file, and it's supposed to be a Kodachrome. That would be glaring evidence, a big, huge red flag. Um, and I'm sorry we haven't gotten to the bottom of this sooner. Um, I did what I could do. The ARB did a very, you know, in between kind of investigation. Roly Zavada did not vouch for authenticity. You've got to understand that. Uh, and that's where we stand today. We have this ongoing case, and the film eventually will be, I think, as important as the body. And when we finally get to the bottom of it all, the film should tell the same story as the, un the unaltered film should tell the same story as the unaltered body, and there should be a correlation between the problems these people faced in altering both kinds of evidence. Thanks. I have five minutes for questions, if anybody wants. We can take just five minutes of questions if there are a few. Yeah. Yes. What I have is I hear everybody talking about Gary Mack. I met Gary Mack years ago, <clears throat> and from what I remember of Gary Mack, I know he did a lot of work in regards to the research right. and, and everything, and now I guess I understood you saying words to the effect that they, ARB was almost afraid to approach him. I don't understand what has happened in this transition in regards to Gary Mack. Well, okay. It's not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to place it just on Gary Mack, so let me be a, uh, like almost be a Marxist and tell you that it's the institution of the Sixth Floor Museum. They're, they make a lot of money, they're very profitable, and they have certain policies. It, 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 no matter who works there, they have to follow the instructions of the museum. What, what the, Jeremy Gunn was worried about was the Sixth Floor Museum, who happened to be Gary Mack, would be the liaison these days to the community of researchers. If he learned, he would go to the New York Times, because he speaks to reporters now. He speaks to, I mean, a very important producer told me a week or two ago that they could only show the head snap once. Why? They could only show the head snap once because otherwise they'd lose their connection to the Sixth Floor Museum. And Gary told them, you know, whatever the policy is, well, you know, I want a Dutch Uncle Gary, but on the other hand, he's not running the Sixth Floor Museum, he's just carrying out their policies. And I also want to point out that my 35 millimeter that I made in New York, I donated this to the National Archives under a special deed of gift. And I have not signed my gift certificate yet, but I would like to challenge, I'd like to see the, the copyright challenged, only I don't have the money to pay for the, uh, the lawyers that would be involved in such a court fight. But you can be sure that there'll be such a fight someday. And I hope that, my, see, my film was made off the Mo Weitzman negative, And I think you can find a, a basis there because the time scale that they hadn't copyrighted it yet. He worked on the Dick the Bells, as I recall. No. You guys the, Who? The Gary Mack. Oh, Gary. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Gary. And I guess I, I hear what you're saying, and this at a loss, I understand where he works, what the policies are, yeah. and all that kind of thing, the guys on the sixth floor, but I mean, as a private individual or, or a citizen and so forth, and all the work that he's done, it just seems that he's very reluctant now to express himself in regards to what I thought was his release before versus where he's at now. You'd have to, you'd have to ask him. I think, I think there's problems there because of where he's employed, and right. who knows, but I mean, he has to follow the policies of an employer. How much could life have been involved in um, um, life would not have optical printers. I mean, you can. You, the answer is the answer is for, life is the life. Uh, life magazine took custodial control of this film starting Saturday when Zabruta sold him the the film. And by the way, I didn't say so, but that auction is really weird because Zabruta goes up the scale. He wants 15, 25, 30, 35, 40. They get to whatever the number is, uh, and uh, Stoli says. The other guy says, uh, I can't go any higher, Mr. Zabruder, without calling my office. Okay? And at that point, what you do when you're on the table, you say, call your office. Because I want more money, right? Zabruder says, fine. Now, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. 
Um, so I suspect there was, you know, I think Stoli is innocent. I think Zabruder has been contacted immediately by the Secret Service. And he's, I mean, he's, he thinks he's involved in some national security thing. And what Jim said yesterday, and this is really important. Remember that film of him showing his hand up here? That is really important. The question is, what does it mean? Now, Jim said, well, it's, he's pointing to a non-existent wound. That's true. I mean, if that's, if that's what he's doing. And he may well be doing that. But is it because he's part of something or has he been briefed? I mean, if, if he's involved with the Secret Service and they gave him already uh, the speech or some speech and they say, look, here's the way it happened, then he's already, he's fronting for that version of the shooting right away. And that's very important to know. That doesn't necessarily mean he's involved before the fact or anything, but that's a really important thing that he's doing. But I'm a little bit worried about it. And I'll tell you why. Because Malcolm Kilduff does this, right? Well, I was very impressed with that, and I ran it in my book. But when you see the motion picture of it, Kilduff says, he was shot in the head. Now, is that a forensic statement about the direction, or is it just, he was shot in the head? Okay. When, when Abe Zabruta says this, I think it's stronger, because I think he uses words and he elaborates a little bit. But it is a non-existent wound, and that's very important to know. And I was just describing that it's a non-existent wound, but we don't know why he's doing this. He may have been briefed, you know, different interpretations. And that's about it. Mr. David Lifton, Magnum.